Hi, we're going to talk about anti-clotting system in this video. Learning objectives um, are here. We're going to talk about the mechanism of action of the two primary anticoagulation proteins, protein C and antithrombin. We're also going to talk about protein S. We're going to talk about the deficiencies of these proteins. And then we're going to address Coumadin therapy, which even now is still our number one long-term anticoagulant heparin therapy, basics, and then the use of heparin for bridge therapy for Coumadin. And then further chapters will discuss the use of heparin as a primary anticoagulant. Protein C is circulated as an enzymogen or inactive enzyme. It's activated by the protein C ACE complex we talked about earlier. And for full activity, it requires protein S uh, as a cofactor. It is vitamin K dependent and it's naturally low in neonates to the point where unless you have no protein C detected, um, protein C levels can be um, 10 to 20 percent and normal. Um, so unless there's no protein C discovered in an infant, um, one can't rule out the possibility that this is simply a, a normal phenomenon of uh, neonate, um, neonatal liver production. It is a serine protease, which means it binds to a serine residue on the target and cuts um, at that site. Its primary targets are factor 5A and factor 8A. Protein S is named that way because it was discovered in Seattle. It's a vitamin K dependent protein, which is also low in neonates. And its job is to um, connect protein C and the um, inflammatory pathway um, uh, and is a cofactor for protein C and is a cofactor uh, for um, activation of the inflammatory pathway. Antithrombin is also a serine protease. Uh, inhibitor. Uh, it's a, called a serpin. It is not vitamin K dependent, and newborns traditionally um, have normal adult levels or near normal adult levels at the time of term delivery. Its target is the intrinsic pathway. It targets factor 10A and thrombin. It can also destroy calcrine and plasmin. Heparin increases the activity of antithrombin many thousands of times. And low molecular weight heparin can affect the geometry of this enzyme such that it attacks anti attacks, uh, 10A predominantly. Anticoagulation with protein C and S then target factor 5 and factor 8, stopping the prothrombinase uh, and 10 ACE complexes and shuts down activation pathways. Antithrombin targets 10A and 2A, which aborts at the fibrin activation stage. Um, and one can remember uh, easily by remembering that vitamin K-dependent factors are attacked by non-vitamin K-dependent antithrombin, and the non-dependent factors are attacked by the vitamin K-dependent protein C and S. And then here's a, a diagram of where they attack. Protein C and S, because they're vitamin K dependent, are frequently the, uh, the root cause of acquired thrombosis. Acquired deficiency of protein C and S is common in what is described loosely as chronic antibiotic use. By chronic, this can mean two or three weeks of antibiotics. So if you have to be on antibiotics for that period of time for a sinus infection, or your child has had several bouts of tonsillitis and has been on antibiotics off and on for the last couple of months, he's at risk for this. Also, malabsorption syndromes, um, Coumadin therapy or, or drugs that would directly inhibit vitamin K, and then fad diets, which are affecting the uh, vitamin intake of the uh, person doing the diet. Also, protein S can be functionally low because of elevation of C4 binding protein. 
the congenital deficiency of antithrombin and protein C are um, larger problems. And we'll talk about uh, antithrombin first. Antithrombin is autosomally inherited. It is the most common um, uh, form of the thing is a simple deficiency. But mutation of antithrombin can also be found, and this can be a functional loss of uh, uh, effectiveness without loss of, of uh, protein. Antithrombin deficiency in humans that are living is only seen in the heterozygous state. This is because the homozygous state is lethal in fetal life. Um, the heterozygous state is mostly asymptomatic. Now, one has to clarify the term mostly because people can go years without problem. People with antithrombin deficiency who haven't had surgical challenges or haven't had other causes to make clot can go um, all the way through childhood without clot uh, and then be diagnosed uh, in an asymptomatic state in their adult life when a family member uh, is found to have the problem. When you do have um, clot during childhood, you have severe venous side thrombosis in childhood. Arterial clot is uncommon. Protein C is also autosomal and it's heterozygous. This is mostly asymptomatic and is associated with venous thrombosis risk largely during um, uh, adulthood or during childhood when there is other venous thrombosis risk associated. The homozygous form um, is a extremely uh, dangerous problem. This is associated with severe clots in both the venous and arterial side beginning in neonatal life. And these people, in order to stay alive, require infusion of protein C concentrates. Coumadin, or dicumarol, or warfarin, is the classical anticoagulant medication. And this is frequently used in the long-term treatment of procoagulant conditions like protein C deficiency. Therapeutic effect is measured using the prothrombin time, or the PT, which is sensitive to 7 and 10, as we've talked before. The problem with the prothrombin time is that it's extremely sensitive to the reagents used in the various labs. And so, comparing the results between two hospitals, even when done on the same specimen, is questionable. In order to make the prothrombin time less of a hassle for the families, um, and more and more uh, understandable by the treating physicians, um, the international normalized ratio, or INR, uh, was developed. And this is a ratio that uses the native PT that was uh, done by the lab as well as other statistics to create an international uh, ratio. The INR is far more reliable than the native prothrombin time and can be interpreted readily between different institutions and also time to time. The normal levels of INR are between 0.9 and 1.2, and the therapeutic levels typically are between 2.5 and 3.5, although rarely it's, it's um, seen where people desire their therapeutic range higher than that, uh, but typically between 2.5 and 3.5. Heparin is, um, exists in two uh, subgroups, unfractionated heparin, which is old school heparin, and low molecular weight heparin, which is relatively recent. Unfractionated heparin is derived largely from porcine sources, and it comes in a variety of lengths and molecular weights mixed together. This can be given IV or subcutaneously, and as you know, this can be abbreviated subcut. Um, and this is monitored using the partial thromboplastin time or an anti 10A activity level. The low molecular heparin differs from unfractionated heparin 
because the piece of heparin that binds to antithrombin is smaller and thus affects its um, uh, tendency to just bind to 10A rather than to bind to thrombin as well. And so the effect it has on the PTT is variable and oftentimes underestimates the effect that it's having on the anti-clotting system. This is um, IV, but most commonly given subcutaneously, uh, particularly in the prophylactic setting. Um, it's monitored using an anti-10A activity level, which can be ordered specifically. In normal-sized adults with prophylaxis, for example, surgical prophylaxis for uh, orthopedic procedure, monitoring of the drug is largely unnecessary because the dose um, response curve for normal-sized adults is well understood. For neonates particularly, and children in general, um, anti-10A levels are required, particularly for therapeutic um, uh, treatment. In obese adults or in adults who have otherwise got multi-system illnesses, anti-10A levels are also advised. Heparin and Coumadin um, interact um, clinically in the pre prevention of this condition, Warfarin syndrome. Typically, Heterozygous, this is caused by heterozygous protein C deficiency, which has not been diagnosed prior. Someone starts pyrosinine coumadin in face of this undiagnosed protein C deficiency and causes the protein C level to drop to um, a low level. Now, typically, this would not be a problem, but when it drops from a half normal level to half of what that person's level is, um, it can get down to levels that are uh, uh, abnormal. This puts the patient into a procoagulant status and they have um, clot forming in small vessels. Um, the issue here is, is that we, in a normal person, there's largely double or even triple redundancy of the clotting factor. But in somebody who has um, half the normal production rate, the redundancy is lost. And so you can easily put them in a situation where with the effect of Coumadin, their anti-clotting uh, uh, system is now uh, markedly impaired compared to the procoagulant um, system, and thus putting the person into a position where they're going to clot and then not be able to turn the clot off. Thrombosis occurs commonly in the skin, and thus the alternative name for warfarin syndrome, warfarin skin necrosis. To prevent the clinical problems of, of imbalance of protein C, um, Coumadin uh, therapy can be interrupted by, for surgical procedures or other interventions by the use of a heparin bridge. Heparin bridge is done with either plain heparin or low molecular heparin, and increasingly low molecular heparin is used preferentially. It's used as a temporary anticoagulation for two or three days till the INR is back to therapeutic. Um, what would happen is we would stop the Coumadin a couple of days before surgery, start the low, low molecular heparin immediately, continue this until their uh, INR was normal, do the surgery, restart the heparin the night of surgery um, if the hemostasis was adequately controlled, and then restart Coumadin the next day. And then once the Coumadin um, had gotten to a therapeutic INR, the heparin would be stopped. Okay, so some review questions. Question one. A 39-year-old woman has a new deep vein thrombosis, or DVT. Her protein C level is found to be 20% of normal. She was started on Coumadin. Two days later, she developed swelling and discoloration of the skin over the dorsum of her right hand and pain in her hand and forearm. Of the following, 
which would be the most likely cause of this new clot? A, progressive vasculitis. B, allergic allergy to Coumadin. C, cryptic protein S deficiency. D, warfarin skin necrosis. Or E, embolic disease from her primary thrombosis. And the answer is warfarin skin necrosis. As we mentioned, that's a classic presentation of the condition. Question two, a neonate at two days of life is found to have ecchymosis scattered across his body. His right leg is cold to the touch and pulses are not palpable. Protein C level is low. Of the following, which we most consistent with a homozygous deficiency. And the answer, of course, is E. The homozygous deficiency would make no protein C or very little. And in a neonate, uh, one would expect no uh, protein C activity. A two-day-old neonate is found to have ecchymosis scattered across his body. His right leg is cold and touch and pulses are not palpable. His protein C activity is not low. Of the following, which is most consistent with a normal term neonate. Okay, this is going to be a challenge. Exit.